Now, before we start actually talking about the medications, I want to go through some other basic things that are just very important that have to do with medications and also some background sort of physiology, anatomy stuff that's going to make a lot of what I talk about make more sense. So um, the first thing I want to point out to you is that I passed around. You either got one of these or you got a small card with a little plastic sleeve. And what this is is something for you to make a list of your medications. This one, you write them in here and tear this out and fold it up and put it in your wallet or purse um, so that you always have a list of your medications with you, updated list, names, and dosages. And if you come out of this class with nothing else but, but learning the importance of that and actually going home and doing it, then this class has been successful. It is very important that you keep a current list of your medications on you at all time. Um, there's a couple of good reasons for that. One is the worst case scenario is you know, you're in an accident and you can't speak for yourself. Very quickly, it gives them information about you that um, could be very important in your care, uh, particularly if you say you're on blood thinners or something like that. So most of these, these cards that have you write down your medications also have a place for you to write in your name any medical diagnosis you may have had. So if you've had heart surgery or heart attack or whatever. Um, so very important to have to make sure you get proper care. The other reason it's important is because it helps the folks in healthcare that are taking care of you to use the time more effectively in taking care of you. And I tell the, the story of, you, you all went through when you first started cardiac rehab, you had a one hour appointment that we do as an orientation. And um, I had a lady show up once with her medications in a tackle box. <laughs> so I had this big box of pills, some she was taking, some she hadn't taken for years. And then she said, oh, but I'm taking this, but that's at home on the counter. And she didn't know the name of it. And there was someone in the bathroom she was taking, and she didn't know the name. And we had to get on the phone and call home. It took me over a half an hour just to figure out what she was taking. And, and I have to think that that lady wasn't also maybe taking her medications in the way that they were prescribed because she didn't have an orderly system for doing it. Um, so, you know, my time would have been spent more effectively you know, helping her with her, her first visit, get to know us and learn more about her. But instead, I was trying to untangle this web of medications. So when you go in to see your physician, you know, hopefully they have an updated list, but they don't always if you have a few different physicians. If you go in with that list and, uh, and it's updated and they get the information within a, a, you know, a minute is all it should take, they have more time talking to you about the things that you want to talk about. So... Um, very important. The other thing I want to make sure that you have on your med list are any over-the-counter medications you take regularly, painkillers, herbal medications. Those herbal medications um, interact with your medications that are prescription medications sometimes, and sometimes in ways that are detrimental to your health. I was at a conference this last year, and they were speaking about cardiovascular medications, and the pharmacist told a story of a fellow that was taking ginkgo. And this fellow also had a seizure disorder for which he took medications. And he did not tell his doctor or his pharmacist that he was taking ginkgo for his memory uh, for whatever reason. But he, he swam regularly, and he was swimming one day. He had a seizure in the pool, and he drowned. No one was looking at the time, and he ended up drowning. And, and on autopsy, they found out that he'd been taking ginkgo. The problem with it was ginkgo interacts with the medication he was taking to make it less effective. Had his pharmacist known that, his doctor known that, they could have upped his medication, and he maybe wouldn't have had that seizure and, and would still be around. So, you know, that's a little bit of an extreme example, but those sort of things happen. So please let your, your doctor or your health care providers know about those herbals that you're taking as well. Okay. Um, all right. So the... Oh, traveling. I want to talk a little bit about traveling, too. I think you're probably all aware of this, though. When you travel, especially if you're on an airplane or wherever you're going, keep your medications with you and you carry on. You don't want to put them in the suitcases checked because you may never see them again, <laughs> and you may go get somewhere where you need them. Um, also, it's a good idea to keep them in their bottles because if you have one of those little dividers and you've got two weeks' worth of medications in there, you know, when they go through your luggage, if they do, all they know is you've got a bunch of pills that they don't know what they are, and that could delay your trip. So um, they're not always marked, you know, the individual pills. So, you know, if you keep them in, your bo in the bottles, you're less likely to have problems with that. Okay. Um, all right, so I want to start um, talking about a couple of things 
just background so that some of what I talk about about the medications will make more sense. Ah. Okay. So if you look at your handout, if we go ahead, there's a picture in there. I think it's on the back page. Is, that, is it where you flip it over? No, it's not. I didn't put it on there. I'm sorry. So it's, it's, it's up here. We can look at it up here. So this is a picture if you were to look inside um, an artery. Oh, it is in there. Okay, thank you. Page three. It's small. Usually it's a little bigger. Sorry about that. But you've got a bigger one up on the screen up here. This is a picture of an artery if we were to, you know, cut it and look down inside of it. And you can see that your, your arteries have different layers in them. They're not just, you know, like a metal pipe and all the same material all the way through. They have different layers of material there. And one of these layers here is a, a layer of muscle cell. And that's important to know that there's a layer of muscle inside your artery because it's telling you your arteries have the, um, the capacity to constrict and get smaller or dilate and get bigger because of that layer of muscle. And a lot of what we're going to talk about about the medications is that layer of muscle being affected in ways that make it dilate or constrict and your medications affecting blood pressure in that way. So we'll, we'll talk more about that, but I just want you to be aware that that's there. The other thing I want to talk about is the difference between angina and a heart attack because there's a lot of confusion when folks first join our program about that. I've had people tell me I had at least, you know, 100 heart attacks last year <laughs> because they think every time they have angina, they're also having a heart attack. So angina is the symptom that your heart gives you, um, you know, if you get a symptom, um, that is saying I'm not getting good blood flow, I'm not getting enough oxygen. And that angina symptom could be uh, some sort of discomfort in the chest or neck or arm or arms between the shoulder blades. Um, and I say discomfort because it can show up a lot of different ways. It could be a tightness, a, a, a squeezing, a pressure, a pain, a vague, I can't quite describe it, but something's not right in this area, you know. So um, that's angina. Now, that might happen with this is going on. Someone has a blockage in an artery where it's shut down blood flow enough that they're not getting enough oxygen to the muscle and the muscle's calling out, you know, somebody help me. So. If you get a blockage that is severe enough, like what's happening here, where the, the little layer on this lesion has ruptured and all this stuff in that, that plaque is spilling out inside the artery, um, if that happens, what happens is within a few minutes you get a blood clot here to help, help heal. Your body thinks it's healing, but it's really not. If you get a clot inside an artery, you go from maybe this is a 20% blockage to 100% blockage within minutes, and that's how people have heart attacks. A heart attack means you have damage to the heart muscle from that lack of blood flow. The, the blood flow um, you know, decrease was severe enough to actually cause damage to the muscle. So that's a heart attack. So, you know, angina means you could be heading toward a heart attack. It's your warning sign. Um, your body responds to any sort of damage, right, by trying to keep you from bleeding by forming a clot. If you cut yourself or if you get hurt internally, it tries to do that as well. And that's what's happening inside this artery here. When that stuff breaks and, and falls out inside the artery, um, platelets rush to that site. And some of the medications we're going to talk about work in ways by slowing or helping to stop that response so you don't get a clot in there should, should a plaque rupture. Okay. The other thing that I want to point out to you is this little equation I wrote out right here. And what that is saying is, is your heart's oxygen needs, so the amount of oxygen your heart is needing per minute to do its work, basically equals your systolic blood pressure that top number in your blood pressure times your heart rate. So it makes sense if you think about it, your heart needs more oxygen whenever your blood pressure or your heart rate is up. When you're exercising, what happens? Your heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up, your heart needs more oxygen to do its work. Now, that can be an issue if you've got blockages in your arteries 
and your heart's not getting the best of blood flow, not like it did when your arteries were clean, um, and suddenly you're doing something, heart rate and blood pressure are up, um, your heart may not be able to get enough oxygen to meet its needs. And the reason that's important to know, again, is some of the medications work by affecting your blood pressure, affecting your heart rate, so they reduce the workload on your heart. Okay, and we're going to get into those individual medications. Last thing I want to give to you before we start talking about the actual medications is this phone number. And this phone number is um, the, uh, a national prescription plan called the Partnership for Prescription Assistance. And if you call this phone number... Um, someone will answer, and they will do about a 20-minute interview with you and help determine whether you are eligible for financial assistance with your medications. So, you know, if you're having trouble or there's one medication they want you to be on that's expensive and it's not covered or whatever, this is a number you can call. A lot of different drug companies are involved in this program, and it's just one place that you go and make this phone call to find out what programs you qualify for. So what they would do is if you qualified, they would send you paperwork that you have to take to your doctor to get signed. This is your diagnosis. These are the medications you're on. And um, then you send it back in. Um, be prepared for personal questions about your income um, because they'll want to know that as well. Okay. All right. Can everyone see that number? You want me to? It's, it's 1-88-477-2669. Okay, so now we get to go back and talk about the meds. All right, so the first medication um, is rapid-acting nitroglycerin. And uh, rapid you, everyone's familiar with this one in the little brown bottle, the little ones that you put under your tongue. It's also called sublingual, which means under your tongue, um, nitroglycerin. This medication is used to help relieve angina when you're in an uh, emergency situation, which would, be, which would be any time you're having angina. Angina is um, not something we would ever want you to have. I've sort of had a rash of people coming through recently saying, yeah, I had my stent, and since then I'm having some angina, but it's just a little. It's not that bad, and they haven't called anybody. You know, and I'm like, well, you know, even a little is not acceptable. So um, nitroglycerin, rapid-acting nitroglycerin, is something that you might use in a situation where you're having an angina symptom. And the way this works is it helps to dilate the blood vessels. So if it, if it dilates blood vessels and causes them to get bigger, um, what's going to happen to your blood pressure? It's going to drop. You know, you've got the same amount of fluid in the system, and the system's getting bigger, so the pressure within the system drops. So your blood pressure would, would drop. And that reduces the workload on your, the, on your heart. Remember, if your blood pressure is lower, your heart doesn't need as much oxygen to do its work. So um, that's basically how it works. It relaxes the arteries in your heart and arteries throughout your body. So it, it will drop blood pressure. Side of, oh, wait. Um, how to take it is, you know, if you ever haven't taken it before, you want to sit down the first time you take it because people who have taken it here can probably tell you with some people it causes a pounding headache. Um, it also can make you feel a little lightheaded and dizzy if it drops your pressure too much. You don't ever want to take your nitro while you're driving. If you, you get, you know, chest discomfort, pull over to take your nitro. Don't take it while you're driving. Um, you can put one under your tongue, and if the symptom isn't gone in three to five minutes, you can put another one under your tongue. And if it's still there in three to five minutes, you can do another one. If you're having to take that third one and your symptom is not relieved, it's time to call the paramedics. Okay, Call someone to come take a look at you. Um, all right. Side effects, again, the headache, um, possible dizziness if your pressure gets dropped. Storage, these medications, um, the sublingual nitroglycerin in the little brown bottle, is a little bit of a hot house flower of medication. It's it's uh, it's fragile in that it degrades easily with exposure to light or heat or air, um, so it needs to be protected, and it will lose potency if exposed to to those things. If you look at your bottle, it has a date on it that's probably two years into the future, and it's good until that date unless you open it. If you open the bottle you should date the bottle, write it on there when you opened it, so that in six months you go replace it. Whether you've used any more or not, replace it, because it's certainly a medication you want to have 
potent and effective if you need it. It's, it can, can save your life. Um, it's, you know, you want to have it with you, but it's, it's not going to be good to have it stored in a car because they, it gets very hot in the car. In your pocket, the pharmacist that I talked to said it's probably okay in your pocket. It's going to be all right, although it's going to be jostled a lot. So, you know, take a peek in there every once in a while. Make sure it's just not a lot of powder because <laughs> they will break down. Um, another option is the sublingual spray. It comes in a spray bottle. looks like one of those little, you know, Banaka sprays they used to sell. Um, and this one doesn't have the same thing about light um, and air, so it will last a little longer. The only thing is if you want to use the spray instead of the pills, you need a prescription that specifies spray. Um, it does cost a little more, and I think insurance companies are hesitant to just give it out unless they've been prescribed specifically to get this. So if you're wanting to, if you use your nitroglycerin and you don't want to be replacing it all the time, you, you might want to ask your doctor about the spray. Any questions about, about that? You know, one other comment just about the, the sublingual nitroglycerin is I have, it's always surprises me through the years I've had a few people say to me, um, yeah, I had some chest pain last night, but I didn't want to take that nitro because it gives me a headache. <laughs> you, know, <clears throat> you know, you've got a headache versus a possible heart attack, so you've got to weigh those things. So I know it's not comfortable, but the headache is not dangerous, um, and uh, the heart attack is. So keep that in mind if you're ever weighing taking those nitroglycerin pills. Okay. There's also a, a long-acting nitroglycerin, and this type of nitroglycerin is not used in an emergency situation. This one is, is not to treat angina. This one is used in prevention of angina. It, um, some people have chronic angina. Maybe they've had a bypass surgery. Maybe they've had two bypass surgeries. Or, um, you know, their, their disease is such that they can't do bypass surgery. And the doctors say, you know, we've got angina, but we just think the surgery is too risky or whatever is too risky, but we're going to manage it medically and the best they can do is that they still have a little bit every day. Some people take this for chronic angina. Um, some people take it temporarily after bypass surgery um, because they use an artery as one of their grafts, and they don't want that artery spasming down that layer of muscle. Um, and it, they do that sometimes um, initially, and they might temporarily put someone on nitroglycerin right after bypass surgery. <clears throat> um, some folks use it for, uh, it's used for blood pressure control. Don't see that as often, but some, sometimes it's used for blood pressure control. It comes in a patch that you, you wear, um, capsules, tablets. Um, if you're in the emergency room, sometimes they use paste, you know, they put on your skin, which is the same thing, basically, it's in the patches. People on this medication can develop tolerance to the medication, and um, meaning it's not effective anymore. It's not doing what it needs to do, and their body's sort of built up a tolerance to it. And they need to go through a, uh, an interval where they don't take the medication, where their physician may say, I don't, I don't want you to not take this one at night. You know, we're going to take you off of it for a few days, and they stop taking it at night temporarily, and then suddenly it starts working them, for them again once they start back on their usual dosage. So that happens occasionally. Now, nitroglycerin... Everybody's seen the commercials for erectile dysfunction that they run all the time. And uh, if you listen to them carefully, you've heard that line where they say, you know, do not take these medications like Cialis, Levitra, Viagra um, in conjunction with nitroglycerin because it can cause a dangerous drop in blood pressure. And the reason for that is the drugs, the Cialis, Viagra, and all those that work for erectile dysfunction, you know, they're, they're treating, if someone cannot get an erection, well, what causes an erection? It's, it's an increase in blood flow. So those medications work by their vasodilators. They cause the blood vessels to dilate and get larger. It's the same thing, basically, that nitro does, just in a different way. So if you're taking two medications at the same time that are vasodilators and cause blood vessels to get larger, blood pressure to drop, it can be very dangerous, and people have died from that. So you don't want to take these medications if you're on a nitroglycerin product. Um, you know, sometimes it, it, you know, it's a joke, and it, these medications, uh, people get them on the black market and think of them as being recreational, but they really have some very strong effects on the body. They're even, um, Viagra is used to treat pulmonary hypertension. So, and, you know, not just men. It, it works on dilating blood vessels in your pulmonary vasculature. So um, 
They're, they're potent vasodilators, so that's an important thing to know. Rather than taking the medications, this would be something good to discuss with the physician um, to see if there's another alternative if, um, if erectile dysfunction is, is a problem for anyone here and you are um, taking nitroglycerin as well. Okay. The next one, beta blockers, and I would bet at least 75% of you are on beta blockers. <laughs> Um, there's a listing of beta blockers here, and I don't know if you noticed on these slides, you know, there, wherever there's an asterisk, it says this medication is available in a generic form. Um, just because there's not an asterisk on here doesn't mean it's not generic now because things change. So um, you could always ask your pharmacist if you want to get a generic form of a medication because the generics are, are cheaper, right? So, um, so don't take our list of meds and our, our asterisks here is gospel because it may have changed some, um, and it will change as the years go on. We also don't have a complete list of medications here. For example, on the beta blockers there, it doesn't list Endorol, which is a beta blocker. And if you notice, all of these products, um, the generic name in the beta blockers, it ends with a LOL. So if your medication ends with LOL, it's probably a beta blocker, you know, the, the generic chemical name. Okay, so the beta blockers are used to treat high blood pressure. It's used to treat angina. They're used also to treat arrhythmias, which isn't up there, and for other things. Um, some people that have familial tremors or migraine headaches, they're used for all sorts of different things. But they're classified as an antihypertensive, meaning they're used for high blood pressure, to treat high blood pressure. Um, how they work is they decrease your heart rate and they decrease your blood pressure by blocking the effects of adrenaline in your body. So if you're on a beta blocker, you've probably been told, if you haven't already noticed, your heart rate doesn't go up as much as it used to. You know, your heart rate might be 60 at rest, and when you exercise, it might hit 70. You know, or before, it would have gone up in the 100-something. So, it, and it's doing its job. That's what it's supposed to do. Um, so you remember that equation. If we can hold your heart rate down and your blood pressure down, your heart can get by doing its work with less oxygen. So um, beta blockers, even though they're used for high blood pressure, I get a lot of folks coming through just out of the hospital that say, you know, I don't have high blood pressure. I had a heart attack. They put me on this blood pressure medication. I've never had high blood pressure, and I, I don't want to take it. Um, and, and they're very upset, and, and it's understandable. But there's, there's a good reason for being on that medication. Remember how I said that it's, um, it's used for high blood pressure and a lot of other things. Um, People who take beta blockers have a, a reduced rate of having a repeat heart attack, and they also have an increased survival rate overall. For, so whether your blood pressure is high or not, if you've had a heart attack or have coronary artery disease, most likely your doctor has put you on a beta blocker. Um, again, if you're following what's going on with medicine in the news, you've probably heard the terms best practices or evidence-based medicine, and that's pretty much the way the practice of medicine has gone, is that the, the government looks at all these things that work. They do all these studies, and they say, okay, take all the studies and look and see these people that are having heart attacks, um, who has the best outcome? Who survives longer? Who does better? And they make a list of things that are called best practices. And on the things for people that have had heart attacks, particularly if it's been a larger one, is you're on a beta blocker. You're taking aspirin every day. There's a list of things that generally happen unless there's a good reason for you not to be on that medication. So, so don't be surprised if your doctor, you know, puts you on this, you know, cookie-cutter list of medications that everybody that has a heart attack is on. It's because they've, the studies have shown that people do better when they take all of those sorts of meds. So, um, so there is a protective effect in taking the beta blockers. Um, side effects on these medications. So dizziness, so, and I'd rather say lightheadedness. You know, I, to me that dizziness means, you know, like if you had too much wine or something and things are spinning. But most people, I think, when their blood pressure drops, they start getting more of a lightheaded sort of thing. So um, if it drops your blood pressure too much, you could feel lightheaded or dizzy. Um, that's something your doctor would want to know about. You know, they, wanna, they want your blood pressure down, but they don't want it down so much that you're having symptoms. So be sure to let your doctor know if you're having something like that. Uh, a, a slow heart rate. And a decrease in heart rate on a beta blocker is normal, but we don't want it so slow that it's giving you symptoms or problems. So, again, if you're feeling 
you know, lightheaded, or if it's running down in the 50s or lower while you're sitting at rest, you know, let your doctor know. If, if it's running 55 and you're feeling fine and not having symptoms, they probably wouldn't be concerned about it. Um, but if it's, you know, running really low and you're having some issues, they definitely would want to probably decrease your dosage. So keep them posted on that. A decrease in endurance. And most of us aren't going to notice that because we don't push ourselves hard. But say you're someone who is used to going out and uh, walking briskly for a few miles a day or running or doing competitive stuff. If your heart rate doesn't get up as high, um, that's less you know, blood per minute circulating, less oxygen per minute, you won't have as high a capacity as you used to. Most people don't notice that because they don't work themselves that hard, but, but some will, and it can cause a decrease in endurance. What most people notice is the, um, the fatigue, which is a whole other thing. Um, that's what we hear probably most commonly with the beta blockers. People will say, God, I'm just so tired. I feel so fatigued since all of this happened. And um, and a lot of times it's the beta blockers, the culprit. But the thing about it is your body can can re, um, adjust to that, and um, that fatigue will diminish with time. So you may call the doctor's office and say, look, I'm really tired, and I've heard it might be this beta blocker, and I want to quit taking it. And they say, hang in there. Give it a couple more weeks because it tends to get better. And the reason they want you to hang in there is because that medication has such a protective effect for people um, that they really want you to be on that one if you can be on it. So they'll ask you to hang in there a bit. Um, it, for some people it could cause um, swelling or um, edema, which is you know some fluid maybe in your lower extremity. Um, so those are things you want to let your doctor know if you have. Shortness of breath, and that's mainly for people that maybe have some obstructive pulmonary disease, emphysema or something, and there's a lot of people out there that have that that don't know it. They've just not been diagnosed. Maybe they don't go to their doctor or they just don't want to know. Um, but we frequently see a lot of people that have a smoking history, never been diagnosed with emphysema, and you might go on a beta blocker and feel more short of breath um, because it can cause some constriction of um, bronchial airways. Some of the beta blockers are more selective and don't have that effect. So if someone got more short of breath on their beta blocker, you let your doctor know they can try a different one that may not have that side effect for you. So again, another reason to you know, keep your doctor or your pharmacist in the loop on how you feel when you're taking your medications. And this is one you don't want to stop abruptly. Um, it's the only one that I know of that can have a uh, rebound effect. And what I mean by rebound effect is if you're, um, let me get rid of this here. If your resting heart rate before beta blockers was at this level and you go on a beta blocker and it takes your resting heart rate down to this level and then you go, I hate this medication, I'm just going to quit taking it. Suddenly your heart rate's up here at rest. It's a rebound effect. And, you know, remember that equation. If you have blockages and you already have impaired blood flow to your heart, you don't want your heart rate up here at rest. It's not such a good thing for your heart. So if someone's going off a beta blocker, it's usually a gradual wean over about three to five days. So you'd want to talk to your doctor about it and so they could set up a schedule on weaning depending on the dose that you're on. Okay. Um, other things that can happen with the beta blockers, is beta blockers can, after a period of time, um, they, they cross over the, the blood-brain barrier and can cause some other interesting side effects. Some people get them, some people don't. Um, for some folks, sleep disturbance and nightmares or impotence are things that can happen with the beta blockers. So again, you know, if, another thing that if you come out of here with nothing else but, you know, keep your medication list current and handy and talk to your doctor about any side effects you think might be related to your medications, I will be a happy woman that you, you came out knowing all of that. Um, we, we frequently see people trying to adjust their own medications and not talking to their doctor about it. And we've got a guy in the hospital right now that is notorious for that. And he, he doesn't know why he's in and out of the hospital, but he's constantly adjusting his own medications and won't work with his doctors on it. So, you know, please keep him posted with what's going on with you. Um, any questions about that one, about the beta blockers? No? Okay. Um, calcium channel blockers. And again, another medication that says used for high blood pressure, used to treat angina because it lowers blood pressure. And so it can help relieve angina. This one, like the nitroglycerin pills, is also used to prevent um, artery spasm. 
we have some folks in our program that don't have coronary artery disease. They have clean arteries that have had heart attacks um, because their arteries have spasmed and shut off blood flow because the muscle clamps down. And it's more often the younger folks that you might see that have that. And um, they'll be on a calcium channel blocker to help prevent that. So these medications work. Um, how they work is by, well, calcium is important for muscle contraction. You have to have calcium um, crossing the membrane into the muscle cell, the muscle fiber itself, to cause it to contract. It's an important part of, of causing that contraction. It's the, it's the signal for the muscle to contract. And the calcium channel blockers slow the movement of calcium into the muscle so there is not as much of a baseline constriction in those vessels. They tend to relax a little bit because they don't have so much calcium bombarding them. So um, you get a little bit of um, dilation in your, not only your coronary arteries, but the arteries throughout your body, <clears throat> and that can drop your blood pressure. I don't want anybody to get the idea that calcium is bad for them, though, it raises your blood pressure. That's not the way this works. You can't, you can't adjust your dietary calcium intake and, and cause any of this to happen. So keep doing your calcium. <laughs> it's important. Um, so let's see. That's basically how it works. Side effects, again, dizziness if it drops your blood pressure too low. Um, swelling, that's a, that edema I was talking about. Some people will get some fluid maybe in the ankles, and some folks that are on calcium channel blockers might also be put on a little bit of Lasix to help them get rid of that extra fluid if they develop this, this side effect. Um, constipation, because if we're slowing muscle contraction and getting muscles to relax a bit, you um, don't have as vigorous a movement through the intestines because it's a wave of muscle contraction that move things through your intestines. So, you know, if you're on a calcium channel blocker, drinking plenty of fluids, um, having plenty of fiber in your diet, maybe taking a regular over-the-counter laxative if it's a consistent problem for you, are things that are encouraged. Okay, and here's where we first encounter grapefruit juice. So, some of you have probably seen on your medication bottles that do not take grapefruit juice with this medication. And because grapefruit has a a specific chemical in it that causes your liver to be less efficient in clearing these medications out of your system, certain medications, not all of them. And if it's not clearing the medication out, it's going to keep building up and you can get higher levels than are necessary or wanted in your system. So if you, um, you know, we you take your medication every day and you have to take it every day because your body metabolizes it and clears it out. So if it's not being cleared uh, as efficiently, you, you could get you know, a buildup of the medications. And for some of the medications, that can be dangerous. So some of the calcium channel blockers do that, and here are a few that, that do interact with grapefruit juice. There are some other medications we're going to get to that have the interaction as well. And how do you know what medications? You, you read the bottles. Your bottles should have a sticker on them if there's any specific, like take with food, do not take grapefruit juice, um, you know, all of that sort of stuff or read the paper insert, or just ask your pharmacist, these medications I'm picking up today, anything special, any special precautions? Um, so that's the person to, to educate you about all that. So grape, I'm going to kind of skip ahead um, to the last few slides and just keep talking about grapefruit juice. And um, grapefruit juice, the way I understand it is if you're having a half of a grapefruit every once in a while, not a big deal. But it's if you're consistently drinking the glass of juice. You know, six to eight ounces of that juice um, is enough to affect the metabolism of, of certain medications. Um, I was also told at that conference I was talking about that they're finding that there are some other juices that interact with medications. Um, and I've never seen these, but Seville oranges, any juice with a blend that has Seville oranges has the capacity to do this. And some of the folks in here have told me that they have... Um, been told that some of their medications that cranberry juice is off limits. So, you know, the most I can say is, you know, I'm not a pharmacist and I don't have the most up-to-date stuff, but the bottles and your pharmacist will. So be sure you're looking at those bottles to know your precautions. Okay. Um, ACE inhibitors. Now, ACE inhibitors, ACE stands for angiotensin converting enzyme. So angiotensin is a, a um, hormone, well, angiotensin is, is a chemical in your body that 
causes a little bit of vasoconstriction. And if we can have less of that, then your arteries are going to dilate a little bit, get a little bigger, which drops blood pressure. So um, if we can stop angiotensin from being made, and angiotensin has to go from uh, something called angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, and if we don't have the converting enzyme that helps with that step, um, you can't make angiotensin. So it's an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. So we're inhibiting the enzyme that helps create the angiotensin. So if you have less of it, you have vasodilation. Um, this medication um, is really helpful in treating high blood pressure, people that have heart failure, which means that your heart function is not as good as it should be, right? A normal heart, when it, it pumps and and pushes the blood out, pushes out about 65% of the blood with each beat. Doesn't push it all, about 65, and that's normal. If your heart function is low, if it's you know down in the 30s or lower, that's heart failure. And that's just meaning the heart's failing to pump as much blood as it should. And frequently folks that have heart failure are on ACE inhibitors because it tends to um, help that heart failure not to get worse. And uh, people that have heart attacks, specifically large heart attacks, are frequently put on ACE inhibitors. And the reason for that is they found that the ACE inhibitors tend to limit something that's called remodeling. So after someone has a heart attack, particularly if it's a large one, the structure of your heart muscle can change in a way where you get an area on there that um, um, gets a, uh, you can get an aneurysm. You can get a thinning of the wall. You can get a weak point in the heart muscle, and you can get a little bit of dilation or bulge there. They call that remodeling, and they don't want that to happen. They want the structure to stay sound in your heart, and the ACE inhibitors can help limit that remodeling and help prevent someone from having further heart failure or complications after a heart attack. So the ACE inhibitors is the list over here to see if you're on one. And again, not an all-inclusive list, but... Um, but these are ACE inhibitors, the most common ones. Um, side effects for some people um, can have an elevated potassium, and that's usually for folks that their kidney function wasn't great to begin with. Um, and the most common thing we see or hear about is the cough. You know, it's a really well-tolerated drug except for the, the cough that some people will get because it can trigger the cough centers in your brain. And uh, so there's nothing wrong with your lungs. It's just your brain telling you to cough, and there'll be <laughs> kind of a dry sort of cough frequently, and it can be very annoying <laughs> to people. So some folks can't tolerate the drug because their body doesn't adapt to that, and the cough continues. So people that get that cough, a lot of times are put on one of these medications, which is an ARB, and that one stands for angiotensin receptor blocker. So these medications let your body make all the angiotensin it wants, but it's gonna, these medications gonna block the little doorway that the medication or that the angiotensin needs to get into to do its work. You know, because there's a, there's a receptor that it has to get into to, to, to do what it needs to do. But if we can block the angiotensin, it's not gonna be able to cause that vasoconstriction and the arteries get to relax a little bit. So, and here are the ARBs. And it was my understanding that they have um, similar side effects, but not so much of the cough. Okay. Now we're getting into talking about the antiplatelet medications, um, the blood thinning medications, uh, those things that are important for helping to prevent your blood from clotting, which if you, um, you know, have a tendency to create blood clots, or you have, you know, lesions in your arteries that, you know, they're, uh, that could be vulnerable to bursting and causing 100% blockage, um, they're probably going to put you on some sort of antiplatelet medication. And the most common one is the aspirin. So aspirin works by um, helping to prevent heart attacks and strokes. 50% reduction in heart attack if you're taking your aspirin daily. That's amazing. You know, that's it's a, probably the single most effective drug of all of these drugs we've got. Um, so w when you get an injury, like what we showed in that artery where there's a clot, platelets have to rush to that spot to, f to form that clot. And they, they, they get sticky, and they rush there, and they stick together and form the clot. You don't want that, you want that to happen on the outside if you get cut, but you don't want that to happen inside an artery. So you take an antiplatelet, and it slows the process. The aspirin slows the process of those platelets getting sticky. So it, it, 
they tend not to congregate there and form that clot. Um, you have to take it every day to get the benefit of it because your body keeps metabolizing it out of your system like any medication. So you take it every day. The other thing is you want to take it every day because you don't know when the plaque might rupture. Um, so if you've already got aspirin on board, it's going to be the most effective. And you've probably seen the commercials that say, you know, if you think you're having a heart attack, take an aspirin. You know, if you're not already on it, you need to take one. And it, it can get in in time to, to cause help, but it's most effective if you're already on it. So, you know, they tell people, too, um, in, unless there's a reason you shouldn't be taking aspirin, you know, they generally recommend that most everybody take an aspirin a day. Um, but there are some good reasons why people shouldn't. Um, so be sure you do talk to your doctor about whether that's a good idea for you if you're not already taking it. Um, because aspirin is over the counter, and I think a, a lot of us grew up before, there were, I don't remember there being any other painkiller type medications when I was a kid. I mean, aspirin was used for everything. You had a fever, you took aspirin. You know, you took aspirin for everything. You're in pain, you took aspirin. And so people kind of think of it as candy, I think, sometimes. They just take it for everything. But it has some very strong effects, so you know, be sure to talk to your doctor about whether it's a good idea for you to take it or not. Um, lots of different products um, on aspirin. Um, the biggest side effects are, are um, stomach ulcer. And the reason that happens is aspirin's uh, real name, let me make sure I get this right, is acetyl salicylic acid. So it's an acid. So your stomach is an acidic environment. And if you put an acid in an acid, you want that medication to dissolve, and acid doesn't dissolve in acid very well. So it just sits there on the lining of your stomach, and it can start to corrode the lining of your stomach and cause an ulcer. So the way to combat that, there's a number of ways. One is take it with food. You know, do not take aspirin on an empty stomach. That's asking for trouble. Um, the other thing you can do is take an enteric coated aspirin which is an aspirin that has a coating that protects the aspirin from your stomach acid until it passes through to your intestine and it dissolves in your intestine very quickly because that's not an acidic environment and gets absorbed in your intestines. So um, an enteric coated aspirin. Now that's different from a coated aspirin and this confuses a lot of people. They say, well, I'm taking a coated aspirin, but it has to say enteric coated. So a coated aspirin is just an aspirin that has a coating on it to help you um, swallow it. Excuse me a second. So it'll just help you swallow the medication. Because you know if you take a plain aspirin, they kind of dissolve and stick in your throat. So, so an enteric coated is an entirely different thing. So look at the ones you're taking, be sure that they're enteric coated. Um, buffered aspirin, they include a coating on there that helps buffer the acid in your stomach so that the medication um, um, passes uh, it has a little bit of antacid around it, rather, so it can dissolve in a different environment. So it makes it a little less acidic right around the aspirin. Yeah? Is it delayed action? It sounds like it is. But, you know, ask the pharmacist, because I, you know, I don't know the brand or anything. But it should somewhere on it say enteric something. But if it doesn't, um, you know, ask the pharmacist. They would know for sure. It sounds like it is, though. Okay. Um, the other side effect that's possible is bleeding, and, you know, that's kind of what the medication does. It, it keeps you from forming clots, and, and it can, in some cases, cause bleeding that is, is undesirable. Um, you will, if you're on one of these medications like aspirin, routinely bleed more if you cut yourself. It's going to take longer to clot, um, so you'll have to hold pressure a little longer, um, and that's ex 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 um, expected. Um, you might get bruising more easily. You know, you hit something or you don't even know what you hit, and suddenly you have a bruise there, and that's pretty common, too. That call that uh, nuisance bleeding. Um, internal bleeding is more of a bigger issue. So if you notice any blood in your urine or stool, something your physician needs to know about. Um, if you have blood in your urine, if it's a little bit, it may look orangey. If it's a lot, it's going to look red. Blood in your stool is going to make your stool look um, black and tarry. Okay. Uh, if you were vomiting blood, if it was fresh blood, it'll be red. If it's a little older blood that's been sitting there in your stomach, it's going to look like coffee grounds. So um, any sudden severe headache, um, you know, could be a bleed. It's something you'd want to, you know, take seriously and let your doctor know about or someone around you know about. Um, and for some folks, um, anemia. So. Um, 
which can be a problem because if you're anemic, you have less oxygen carrying capacity in your blood, and we want you to, you know, have lots of oxygen in your blood, specifically if you already have uh, impaired um, circulation in your heart. All right, so next we're going to pass up our, our picture and then go on to um, Plavix. Anyone here on Plavix? Yeah. <laughs> so um, Plavix um, helps prevent heart attacks and strokes by helping to prevent that clotting. It's also used frequently when people have stents implanted to keep them from um, forming clots around the stent because the stent's a foreign body and there is a little bit of damage that happens in the arterial wall when that stent's put in there and is implanted and you're, you're you know, anytime there's a scrape or anything like that, your body tries to make a clot to heal it. So um, it's frequently used after people have, have stents implanted. This works by making the platelets less sticky uh, so that they tend not to stick together. There, there's an issue with this medication in that one in ten people on it quit taking it because of nuisance bleeding. You know, that bruising we were talking about, that minor bruising or a little bleeding, like maybe they get a nosebleed every once in a while and they blow their nose. It's not bad, just a little. Um, um, you know, things that aren't dangerous, but they're called nuisance bleeding. And, and that's not good because, you know, missing one dose of Plavix um, can be fatal. I mean, you know, we see people stop taking their Plavix, their, clot, their stent clots up, and they're back with a heart attack. So if you're on Plavix, you need to take it at the same time every day and take your medication and, you know, be sure you've, you've got a good supply handy. Um, the problem with it, it's only available as brand name, it's not generic yet, and it's an expensive medication. So it does create a hardship for some people. And if that's the case, you know, d discuss that with your doctor and see if they can work out a plan for you. 85% of the people on this medication report that nuisance bleeding. So it's very common sort of thing um, and, and not dangerous. Oh, our, our nurse practitioner, nurse practitioner um, asked me to pass along to everybody that the one thing she wanted you to get out of this lecture today was that you please take your medications at the same time every day, too, because it, it does affect how they work and um, try and stay on a regular schedule. Um, so I, I kind of forgot to add that in in the beginning, but uh, I want you to, to know that. <clears throat> okay, so my ear is plugged up and my voice is echoing in my head. Is it coming out okay? <laughs> All right. Okay, uh, warfarin, which is Coumadin. And we see Coumadin a lot for folks that have um, had heart valve replacements, are, are in atrial fibrillation or go in and out of atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular heart rhythm, um, or have a history of developing blood clots in their lungs or their legs. So it's an antiplatelet uh, also that will, um, well, it's not, it, it does stop the formation of clots by affecting clotting in a, a different way. Blood clotting is a really complicated thing, and I'm not even going to pretend that I know the whole sequence, but there's a lot of steps to your body forming a clot, and this one forms and works in affecting one of those steps to forming a clot. Um, it does work differently from aspirin, and, um, you know, these drugs, the, the aspirin, the Plavix, the Coumadin, aren't necessarily replacements for each other. You know, if they want you on Coumadin, you can't say, well, can I take aspirin instead? You know, that needs to be discussed with your doctor because they don't work in the same way. They all work a little differently. Um, this drug, I don't usually go into a lot of information about this drug because folks who take this usually go to a Coumadin clinic. They go to a special place where they get education about this medication. They get blood draws routinely. Um, so, you know, for everyone else who maybe is not taking it, you know, the things to know is basically this... Um, Warfarin is the active ingredient in most rat poisons. <laughs> so it, uh, you know, when you're killing a little beastie, what you're doing is, you know, giving it enough uh, anticoagulant that it bleeds to death internally. So um, it's a great medication to prevent blood clots, and you want enough of it to prevent clots, but not so much to cause excessive bleeding. So people that are on this medication have to go in and get blood draws regularly to be sure that they've got that proper steady state level in their body. Um, the other thing to know about this medication is what you eat and drink can affect the levels in your bloodstream. So that's why the folks that are on Coumadin get education about the things that they should stay away from, and, um, and a lot of times it's uh, green leafy vegetables, green tea, organs, organ meats, anything that's high in vitamin K. There are some dietary limitations with this. Um, so questions about that one? 
um, the statins. So these are the cholesterol medications, and uh, they lower cholesterol. It says it here by 30 to 50 percent. So they can reduce the risk of coronary artery disease or the risk of progression of coronary artery disease, those blockages. This medication is so effective in helping that that in the UK, this is over the counter, kind of like aspirin is here. They've tried twice to get that passed here. It's failed both times, <laughs> so I don't know why. But, um, but in the UK, you have to answer a couple questions to the pharmacist before you can buy it, but you can buy it over the counter in, in a little lower dosage than what's prescription. Um, so not only do these lower cholesterol, but they also they change the environment in the inside of the blood vessels so that there tend to be less inflammation. And if you've been following anything about coronary artery disease lately, you know, all the latest research is on inflammation. The, there's inflammation causes all of these uh, changes in, in aging and in coronary artery disease, and there's, there's a lot of research on inflammation. So, you know, again, I get people back that are in the hospital and say, you know what, my doctor's been checking my cholesterol for years. It's always been great, and, you know, now I have, um, I'm on this statin. Why am I on the cholesterol medication? Mine's, it's fine. Well, it's because not only does this medication lower your cholesterol, but it reduces your risk um, of, of developing blockages by changing the environment inside the blood vessels so they have less inflammation. So, you know, it's a good medication to be on. It does have a couple of important side effects to know about, although they are extremely rare. Um, you know, less than 1% of the people that are put on these medications develop one of these side effects. And the first one is liver damage. And um, it is reversible when the medication is stopped. You have to really be ignoring the symptoms um, to get to a point where it's not reversible. Because if you start having liver failure, um, you're going to turn yellow. <laughs> you're going to get jaundiced. You're going to have pain. You might get distense, distended at your abdomen. Um, your urine would get dark, your stools would get light colored. Um, there would be things that you would have to be ignoring uh, to, to get to that point. So a lot of folks, when they're put on the statin, their doctors will do lab work to see uh, what their liver enzymes are and then recheck it, you know, after they've been on the med for a while just to make sure your liver's okay. So that's a pretty common thing that they do. Um, so the other thing is muscle damage and the sign of this is going to be pain. It's going to be muscle aching and pain all over. Not just one muscle here or there, but a generalized body ache. Um, the danger with this is if it's ignored and you get enough muscle damage, uh, enzymes are released into your bloodstream when you have muscle damage that need to be cleared out through your kidneys. And, you, and if it overwhelms your kidneys, you can have kidney failure. Um, but like I said, both of these are very rare. The symptoms are pretty obvious. So if you notice any of this, you want to talk to your doctor about it. Okay. okay. Um, again, the statins are ones that react with um, grapefruit juice. So be sure to look at your bottle to see if your statin is one of those that uh, does that. Common side effects with the statins, they're, they're pretty well tolerated. Some people get some GI distress, abdominal pain, gas, um, constipation. Um, some folks will... Um, describe having a headache. So again, let your doctor know if you think you're having a side effect that uh, is, is not tolerable for you. So let's see. So there are other um, drugs that work to help lower cholesterol. This one works by affecting the production of cholesterol in your liver. We all have cholesterol in our bodies. We have to. It's part of the building blocks of, of our cells. But when you have too much is when it's a problem. So it affects your liver and production and can slow production. There are other lipid-lowering drugs, and some of them work by affecting your liver. Some of them work by um, uh, blocking absorption of different fats in your intestines. So you've all seen that commercial for the medication that says, you know, this is... Uh, this medication works two ways. Which one is it? It's a uh, uh, Vitorin. Vitorin. So it's uh, the cholesterol from you know your family from Uncle Joe, and the other from the Sloppy Joe or whatever. You know, so it's it's your own genetic predisposition maybe to make too much cholesterol. Some of the medications work that way by affecting your liver, and some of them work to block um, the fats that you take in in your diet that can cause you your liver to go in overproduction. So you can you can affect production of cholesterol by what you eat. 
So some medications work by uh, working with what you eat, and some work by affecting your liver and what you produce naturally. <clears throat> okay. Um, diuretics. The diuretics are medications that help draw extra fluid off your body. And some folks are on those because of side effects from other medica medications. Some people are on it because uh, it helps treat their high blood pressure. Um, and there are uh, people that have heart failure on occasion will have a tendency to hold on to extra fluid and build up fluid in their ankles or hands or abdomen um, and will be on a diuretic, something like Lasix, uh, to help them draw that extra fluid off. <clears throat> the diuretics work on your kidneys by causing your kidneys to uh, excrete extra fluid. And in doing that, they can sometimes affect your electrolytes. Your kidneys also help control, um, well, not control, but they, they are sort of a, um, a well, let will just say control, your, your levels of your electrolytes. So calcium, potassium, sodium, magnesium, those sorts of things. And if you don't have those electrolytes in proper balance in your body, you, you can have side effects. Um, so... Um, Side effects that can happen with diuretics are things like dizziness, excessive urination, which, I, I don't know, to me that's what it's doing, what it's supposed to do. You're going to pee more if you're on, you're on one of these. Um, you might get muscle cramps if your electrolytes are thrown out of balance. Um, so if you notice any of these sorts of things, you want to be sure to let your, your doctor know. Frequently, if someone is on a diuretic, they're also on potassium because uh, the diuretics tend to flush a lot of the potassium out of your system, so they'll give you some potassium along with that medication. Um, the dosages, some people take it every day, every day, same dose. Other folks use it to help control that fluid depending on how much fluid they have on them. So they may have been instructed by your doctor, weigh yourself every day. If you gain four pounds and you notice that swelling, I want you to take one extra dose. They may have worked out with their doctor a schedule. Or it may be that they call their doctor and they tell them how to adjust it when they're having problems. So some people take it routinely, and some it's kind of a varying thing depending on symptoms and, and how much fluid they're holding on to. Okay. Um, the antiarrhythmics, um, there's a lot of antiarrhythmics, but we just listed the, the two most common ones, which are digoxin and amiodarone. And digoxin um, or linoxin, um, is used most commonly to, to treat atrial fibrillation or heart failure. It slows your heart's contractions and makes them more forceful. Um, so it, it can help stop certain arrhythmias, and it can help some folks with heart failure. Um, Digoxin digitalis is also foxglove if you're a gardener. <laughs> it's that flower foxglove. Um, so atrial fibrillation, just for those who might be curious, is um, where the, the, your heart normally you know, has chambers in it, has the top chambers and the bottom chambers, and the top chambers are called the atrium, the bottom, the ventricle, and they beat like that. You get the top one, then the bottom one, top one, bottom one. And um, atrial fibrillation means that atrium, rather than doing this contraction thing, fibrillates. So it just kind of quivers and doesn't end up forcing the blood out and down to the ventricles. So what can happen is you can get clots up in that, that atrium, and um, you don't want that. So people that are in, in atrial fibrillation, remember we said before, frequently are on something like Coumadin, a blood thinner to keep them from getting clots because of that lack of, of forceful blood flow through that atrium. So um, to help control that arrhythmia, sometimes folks are on the digoxin. Um, amiodarone, used for the same sorts of things, atrial or ventricular rhythms, ones from the bottom of the heart. Now, amiodarone um, is something that if you're on long-term, your doctor's probably doing some pulmonary function tests because if used long-term, it can cause changes in the lungs that are not good. So, you know, if you are on amiodarone and you've noticed any increase in shortness of breath, it's certainly something to bring to your doctor's attention because they want to do some tests on your lungs to make sure that medication isn't causing any negative changes. Um, side effects, you know, looking at the side effects, um, I want to go back just a little bit to digoxin. Um, if you have too much digoxin in your system, it can get toxic. So if you're on digoxin and you notice your heart rate getting slower and slower and slower at rest, um, that could be a sign you're getting too much of that built up and you need to 
talk, call and talk to your doctor. You might also notice that you see a yellow-green halo um, or feel nauseous. Um, with the amiodarone, shortness of breath, or you could see a bluish halo with that one if you're getting too much of it in your system. Um, so let your doctors know if you have any of those symptoms. All right, and then we're, we're to um, the grapefruit juice. So um, again, the drug levels of certain drugs will rise if the drug um, is not broken down as effectively because of the grapefruit juice. Um, six to eight ounces of regular regular strength. <laughs> I've never seen you know light light strength grapefruit juice um, will produce that effect and. Most likely, just a half a grapefruit every once in a while is not going to cause a problem. But, you know, with any medication, you've got to look at who's the person, okay? So, you know, I'm not a very big person, and let's say it's me, and I'm 80 years old. You know, should I be drinking four ounces a day? You know, probably not, because a smaller person that's older that doesn't metabolize as, as much of something might have an issue even with four ounces. But if it's, it's a, a big person and they're 40, you know, they, they can get away with a little bit more metabolically than, than the smaller person who's older. So you gotta, you got to look at all those things, too, um, when you're looking at the guidelines. And here's a list of medications. So you see the calcium channel blockers over here. We also see um, um, statin medications. There are a few anxiety-type um, medications and the Viagra listed. So just be sure to read your bottles, and, and you'll be up on all that.